oftentimes what I like to tell my clients is also the hardest word to hear is practice. And over time, you'll develop those skills. And it sucks to hear that, but it's like, take out that piece of paper right now, that pencil and think about kind of what triggers you. Think about what helps helps you in a work environment or just what helps you understand in general and what would be ideal for someone to understand and have a piece of paper. And when you're looking for jobs, applying for jobs in a workspace, see if any of those can be a check mark crossed off and you can kind of have your little cheat sheet there for you. But the word that everyone hates, but it's true, is it comes over time with practice. ADHD Rewired episode 354. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Jessica McLaren. And Jessica is a 27-year-old who has learning disabilities and ADHD and has her master's degree from Columbia University in social work. She is an active advocate for individuals with ADHD and learning disabilities. Jessica actively takes her own experiences as an individual with learning disabilities and ADD to others. She wants others who have learning disabilities and ADHD to learn from her experiences so they can understand themselves better and be better advocates. She is passionate about her work and refuses to let any setbacks stop her. Just change the pronouns and the name, Jessica, and I feel I could have written the same thing about myself. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty rewarding, definitely, for sure. So you learned that you had uh, ADHD as well as a uh, as uh, some learning disabilities when? When I was in high school and I was in ninth grade, actually, I found out that it was my English teacher that reached out to the principal, that reached out to my parents, thinking that you might want to get her tested for a learning disability. And then that's when my world changed upside upside down. So what was going on at that time? So funny thing, I actually did public and then private high school. So it actually was a longer period of class. So it was an hour and a half instead of 45 minutes. And my English teacher made me read out loud. And I paused a lot. I stuttered. I didn't know how to pronounce a lot of words to the point actually super embarrassing where she stopped me and then picked on another student to read. Oh, gosh. So that uh, that was super embarrassing. Turned bright red. Mm. Um, and that's when really my world turned upside down. So what was your when when this uh, the school reached out to uh, your parents? How was their response? My parents were very much open. I, um, I'm the oldest. I have two younger siblings. My parents, my parents were very open to the idea and as far as I'm aware, very willing to get me tested because obviously um, I did get tested. And I found out about my English teacher, obviously um, a couple years later after when I started asking more questions Mm -hmm. about like, why did the school randomly like kind of say you should get get tested? And also they saw a drop in my grades as well, which also kind of put them to, hmm, maybe something's going on. Now, you, you told me that when you were first diagnosed, you kind of had a hard time accepting uh, the diagnosis. Yes. So a big thing that I had a hard time was really is putting my name as Jessica McLaren, someone that just learns differently. I thought something was wrong with me. It was really embarrassing because at that time to get extra time and I got a reader, I'd have to go up to the, the front of the room with a folder and everyone knew what that folder meant that that person is going to get extra time and get tested in another room. So 
super embarrassing. Mm. Didn't want to go up at all. So oftentimes didn't really want to take advantage of my accommodations. And probably the most embarrassing of it all was every Friday after school, I saw a reading specialist. So I couldn't hang out with my friends because right after school, I had a reading specialist. So I often would lie to my friends and say, oh, I have a meeting or, oh, I'm playing this one sport. And I said, like, I'm playing tennis, made up a sport like every other week, just to kind of put in the blank because I didn't want to be what, a ninth grader going to see a reading specialist. Mm. That's having someone teaching me how to read all over again. Super embarrassing. So... And then you said when you were a junior, you uh, you met someone that started to kind of change your perspective. Yes. So um, he's known as the man in the wheelchair. So like I said, I'm the oldest. So we did college digits pretty early. And every school we visited, we visited with the director of disability services. Me, I did not want anything to do with it. I just sat and kind of twiddled my thumbs. Now, this is where the, my life changed from downside to upside the man in the wheelchair. So we were visiting Carnegie Mellon and the director is just kind of yapping and I'm just kind of like, whatever, don't really care. I just want to leave. Then he looks at me and goes, Jessica, what's the difference between you and me? So say you were a junior in college. What would you say? Or junior in high school, excuse me. I would say, I said, you're in a wheelchair. He goes, no, I walk with four wheels. You walk with two legs. The only difference is how we walk. That's just like learning. The only difference is you learn with a reader and some extra time. And I just learn better when I read things with my eyes. You learn better when you listen to the books, when you not just read it with your eyes, but when you have audio. So it's, we both learn. It's just, we use different skills. And then that's when my, my life changed forever. And I knew that I'm supposed to help other students see this and hopefully have other students and help them accept their learned disability and ADHD way before I accepted mine. Do you think at, at that moment when you were uh, having that conversation, do you think you knew how profound that was going to be for you? Or is it something that maybe like you kind of planted a, a seed that really grew in you? It definitely planted a seed that grew. It took probably about, I would say, a couple months before it actually kind of developed because then I decided to when I have my extra time, let me actually use the reader. And once I used it, then my grace started improving. And then I was a little bit more confident in expressing to my friends, oh, I can't hang out. I have to go see, I would say, a tutor. Not necessarily my reading specialist, but it did plant a seed and it took a couple months for it to actually develop into a plan. And then I like to say, got into this big tree now where I'm kind of looking over everyone trying to help give them a leaf a little bit. Mm. Did you end up sharing with your friends, um, kind of what your, what your truth was when you were in high school? I did. Yeah, I did. It was definitely senior year of high school when I shared it. And then that's also when I really understood it for myself and understood that the importance of my accommodations and how successful I am, but not just that, but how that's really when I learned that there's so many successful people in the world that have learning disabilities or ADHD, but it doesn't get talked about. And so just understanding that, and also I did some research myself, just knowing that and knowing that invisible disabilities exist, but there's so many people that are out there that are successful, that are making an impact. And that's really what also drove me and made the plant want to grow a little bit more. Mm. So how was college for you? College actually was pretty awesome. I did a lot of self-advocating there. That's really when I learned how to self-advocate for myself. And it's really when I learned how to, I say, brag about my disabilities. Mm. Because I often tell people, you know, we have, we sat through hours and hours of dreadful testing that I would not like to go into detail about. But I think everyone understands if, if you went through any testing, dreadful repeating, like, Oh my gosh, it's like you're back in kindergarten. But I say we have documentation on how we will learn. Some people may never know how they learn. So I'm like, brag about it. Like we had to sit through hours. Yeah, that is Some kind people, of a neat thing. Yeah. Oh, I can't, it was dreadful. But so talk to him about 
because when you know when I was diagnosed uh, with ADHD, I was in I was in college. I was, I was nineteen, going into my sophomore year. But I, you know, growing up, I, I had an IEP, and I remember um, uh, like when I took the ACTs. I remember the first time I took the ACTs. I don't remember how bad my score was, but it was not good enough to get into any college. And I didn't have accommodations for that that. Uh, the, for the ACT. And then I took it again with a reader. And I think I shot up like, I think I first got an 18 maybe. And then I got, and then when I did it with a reader, I got a 26, which really, you know, for, for me, it was like, Oh, I can, I can listen better than I can read. Cause my brain just wanders like profusely when I, when I'm just reading. Um, so I, you know, I'm a, a voracious uh, audiobook reader and I say, I read with my ears, right? It's like, I, I, and I, I own that, right? And I, I like that. And I'm like, you know, so, so when, when everyone's like, oh, but do you, re, you know, do you really read? I'm like, yeah, I really read with my ears. Yeah, people don't, if they haven't really experienced, they don't understand about how like more attentive, like when I read with my ears, I'm definitely more attentive. I'd rather, especially with textbooks and everything in college, I would have like a piece of paper and pencil in my hand, like ready to like just write rather than when I actually would be reading with my eyes, I wouldn't be more focused on how I'm trying to like sound out the word mm-hmm. and then like reread the sentence all over again. And then next thing you know, it's a half hour later and I've only gotten a paragraph read rather than reading. It's like a half hour, half a page. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, when you were diagnosed or any point, did you take uh, ADHD meds? Yes. Yeah. I took um, five yams, which pretty much saved my life. And I did do the little testing of, you know, not taking it and seeing how you're doing. So on the weekends, I would do that. Or even during the week, sometimes I would, you know, not really want to do it. And oh, there's no way for me sitting, sitting still, there's mm-hmm. no way for me to actually like pay attention to what's going on. Um, let's talk about advocacy. Cause I think that self advocacy is so important, not just for students, but I think for as an adult living with ADHD, and one of the the sort of the I guess philosophies or frameworks, however you want to think about it, is if you are an adult with ADHD and you want to be successful, you have to figure out ways to bend the world to you because the world's not going to bend the other way. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in terms of First, I guess in, in college, what did self advocacy look like for you? So in college, self advocacy looked like I would introduce myself to all my professors at the um, their first class, and at the beginning or at the end of class. You mean you wouldn't wait I, until you were struggling? Oh, I struggled that during. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't have time to wait, man. I was like, I just want to get this over with, so then I, my face can go back into the back of the classroom. But this is this is exactly what I said. Hi, my name is Jess McLaren. It's nice to meet you. I just wanted to say that um, I am part of Disability Services Center. I have a learning disability and ADD and my accommodations as I get um, a reader for exams, a note taker and extra time. It's very nice to meet you. If you have any questions, let me know. I look forward to being in class. So I literally said it like as fast as I th- said that right now <laughs> because I wanted it to be it like, like done in... It was literally like a script. Like I said it that fast and was praying they didn't have any questions so that I could just kind of like go about my day. But I literally said it that fast. How too. was it received? They actually took it pretty well. I had one professor who actually noticed that I was, it was abnormal psychology. And he noticed on my exams, which were all multiple choice tests, I was doing very well. So he called me into his office and he knew I had a reader and said, you know, would you like to retake the exam? And, you know, you can have a reader. And I said, yeah, sure. I'd love to. So I thought he was going to literally take the exam and read every question to me like my reader would have done. He literally asked me two questions. He said, can you please tell me about one disorder from the DSM? Any disorder. I was like, okay, schizophrenia. And he's like, okay, can you please just describe some, you know, characteristics about it? So obviously I knew some other than I just kind of made up, made up right in the moment. And he's like, okay, great job. B. Wow. It was like a 15 minute like test, right? 
so I was just like thankful that he gave him that opportunity. And then here comes the best part. He said, for the final, I could write a paper on anything I want and get an A in the class. It has to be 10 page or take the exam. Obviously, I'd pick paper because I'm better at writing than I am at doing multiple choice quizzes. But that's what it really opened up my eyes to see that me by self advocating, how far it can actually get me. So I just took the first steps of introducing myself and having the professor know my name and knowing that like disability services. And next thing you know, he's reaching out to me. So this kind of also put a spark to my brain to say, how can I help do this to others right now as an adult? Spark in the brain of, I'm giving you this information, some blanks need to be filled in. Now, what are those blanks that need to be filled in? And here's the grateful outcome we have of self-advocacy. Mm. All right, we are talking to Jessica McLaren. We are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more stories of self-advocacy. And we will be right back. Winter sessions for ADHD Rewired's award-winning coaching and accountability groups are now full. Thank you to everyone who attended our registration events. Once again, we've had more people who wanted to sign up than we had spots available for. So for those of you who have been listening to this podcast for a while and keep thinking that you're going to join, make sure you get your name on our spring coaching group interest list. If you are new to the podcast, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Since 2014, community has been at the core of what ADHD Rewired is all about. And a huge part of our community is our coaching community, which includes our 10-week intensive coaching and accountability groups and our alumni membership community, where coaching group alumni continue to get support once their coaching group ends. While our winter sessions are now full, spring sessions are April 7th through June 18th. Registration is by invitation only. So if you want to make sure you get invited when registration opens, go to coachingrewired.com and click on that green button. You will get all the information on how to attend our invitation only registration events this March. To all of our fall coaching group members, it's been an amazing 10 weeks. To our winter coaching group members, our journey begins January 6th. To learn more and to add your name to our spring interest list, go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. Did you know that listeners like you can support this podcast by becoming a patron? Just go to ADHDrewired.com and click on the Patreon tab at the top of the page. I want to thank Alex H. for becoming a patron at the $3 a month level and Sign H. who became a patron at the $5 a month level. Thank you to all of our new and longtime patrons who help support me and my team. Whatever you can give, I really do appreciate it. And when you support ADHD Rewired on Patreon, you can get cool perks starting at just $5 a month. All of our $25 a month patrons get to join me for a group coaching call on Tuesday, December 22nd at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. We do these for patrons every fourth Tuesday of the month. And if you can give just $10 a month, you can have access to the recordings of these Patreon coaching calls, plus a bunch of extra content. And if you would pay just $5 a month for ad-free episodes of ADHD Rewired, let us know. There's still a couple weeks left to vote on a poll that we have on our Patreon page. If you would like ad-free episodes for just $5 a month, go vote and we'll make that happen if enough of you respond to that. If you find value in this podcast, in the community, in everything else we do, and you're able to become a patron, all of your support is appreciated. To become a patron, go to ADHD Rewired and click on that Patreon tab at the top of the page. Or just go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. All right, we are back. So I understand you have a lot of other stories of, of how sort of self-advocacy kind of paved the way for you to to really being where you are now, which has really inspired you to helping others do the same. 
Are there any other stories that you can share with us about where, where self advocacy was, where it kind of fuels your why and is in that sort of inspiring, like, here's what I did. And this was the outcome. So definitely, I would say a lot of that happened outside of college when I was some of it in grad school with, with the why was when I really delved more deep into the social work and also how me as an individual with like a learning disability and ADD can really help the greater good and and other individuals like that. So what really helped me with advocacy in that sense in grad school was just finding out different ways. And I even started a, my own little like, you know, club at, um, at the school for other students with learning disabilities just to kind of come and just as like a cohort and just be a support and be friends that kind of didn't really understand each other very well. Right. But now have, we, have you ever you had know, that like yourself being a part of something like that? Yes. Yeah, so I have, I have been a part of um, actually this past during uh, the COVID and everything when a lot of people were unemployed, I, I helped create this accountability group and um, there's some of the, friends I met from different organizations that have ADHD. And we decided that every, every day at 10 a.m., we're all going to get on Zoom and just go through each other's schedules and see what needs to be held accountable. So I found that me, what was really helpful for me as an individual was to putting that first step forward and to say, let me reach out to my friends because I know I need help with this they probably could benefit. And as together as a team, we can do that. And that's something that can be passed along and also can be used when they go to talk about advocating for themselves and their careers. They can say, what really works best for me is if I do blah, blah, blah. Meaning if I do, I need to make sure that I work. I start my day at 8 a.m., then I make sure I take a lunch break. Then I know I like to meet with my boss or supervisor at three o'clock. And then I know that my day will end at five. So a lot of time it's just trial and error, but they know that this is what works for me. So now when I advocate for myself, especially with my work and now with things being a lot with remote, I'm a little more flexibility, but also have that stability. So it's also interesting to see how much you can learn from your friends, especially with similar mindsets. Have you, um, how have we navigated maybe uh, some more difficult scenarios where you maybe were trying to advocate for yourself and it just, it wasn't connecting and it, and it maybe even backfired? Have you, have you had experiences like that? Yes, definitely. I've had some experiences with um supervisor actually in graduate school who just didn't really understand that I needed, um, that it took me a little bit longer to read things. I needed things on audio. And also she didn't really understand that my memory isn't perfect, that I often write things down. So to have her kind of maybe speak a little slower when she's asking me to have her email, she just didn't get that. She just thought that it was just being lazy. Mm. And that's something that really got me frustrated. And I tried to figure out ways to tell her without disclosing that I have a learning disability and ADD. And then I ended up telling her that I have, I didn't say I have ADD, I have learning disability. I say I learned better by doing this and she still didn't accept it. So basically what I had to do is for a full year, I had to just try to keep in the anger Mm. and just really, that's when I really had support from my friends and really asked people that I know that have learned displays themselves that have jobs. How do you get through this? My boss is my supervisor is not helping me. The school's not doing anything. There's nothing I can do. What do I do? So that's really when I valued the network or having friends that have disabilities, but also just knowing people that have jobs as well. Mm. But oh man, <laughs> it's very hard to keep in that like anger that you want. And you just want to like tell the world and just tell them your story, but knowing that like as an adult, there's always a time and place and being aware of that and also being aware of 
you know, how your emotions can come off. And I say everything negative can be turned into a positive. So that experience has actually taught me a lot about myself and about careers and about people that I like to have be my bosses. Yeah. So, and this was uh, someone who was in, you know, in the field of social work, right? Yeah. Crazy, right? You'd think. I, I know it sounds crazy, but you know, so you're saying that not all social workers are these like really empathetic, trying to really understand where the person is coming from. I mean, it's, I know it sounds weird and I'd like to think that that's an anomaly. Um, I, I had one of those too. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's, and sometimes I often wonder when, especially when dealing with people in these related fields, when you sort of get this, this like, it's almost puzzling when, it, you know, they're in this helping profession and yet they feel, they seem very like unempathetic to uh, what you're trying to, to ask for. I sometimes wonder, are these people who are maybe working like, 10 times harder than their colleagues because they're also masking their own potential like learning stability or ADHD. Because um, I do find that that in, in some of these kind of dynamic relationships, that the ones that are just seem to be more, like more inflexible are ones that like are really working hard to hide their own issues. Yeah, no, for sure. I definitely, definitely noticed that over time is, especially people in the, social work, psychology kind of field counseling. That's something that I have noticed over time, especially now that I'm doing some coaching. Executive coaching is they're really the ones that are the, the people that are kind of the over over achievers, the ones that are very much one minded, very much always kind of stuck doing their work. They're definitely trying to hide something. Mm -hmm. So I definitely that's definitely something that's pretty valid that I kind of know for a fact because I've also noticed that on one of my coworkers and I tried to befriend her to just, you know, kind of have her as a friend and she just really wasn't into it. Mm. So then I, I just picked up on some of the, how she was working and trying to nonchalantly show other ways that could be helpful. But it's just very interesting how that very much so is noticed. So you'd say that one of the things you learned is what you are looking for in a boss. On a very sort of practical level, how do you, how do you get that? Cause I mean, we've all heard and have probably all had some really bad bosses in our lives, right? And for the, the, you know, the, probably the lucky minority of, who've had some really good bosses, it can be a real joy to, to work for someone who really like supports you, understands you and focuses on helping you do more of what you're really good at versus trying to like get you to, you know, that performance improvement plan to do the stuff better that you'll probably never be great at. So what did you do to seek a, a boss that really works for, for who you are? So what I first did before I did the job searching and also just to kind of have is I wrote on a piece of paper everything that helps me learn. Mm. I started writing down a piece of paper, everything that helps me learn. And then I also would write down and think about maybe in my past about what I find difficult doing. So if it's responding to emails right away, if I have difficulty with completing a task that is, um, you know, a week long in two days. So I just kind of pick up on things that I find difficult, things that work well for me. So then when I have an interview, I kind of have an idea of already questions that I'm looking for. And I can ask them how flexible they are about certain things. Yes, yeah, share, share, share this some of the questions that you might ask or maybe have asked in an interview. So one thing is I ask, do you guys have weekly supervision meetings? And I then would say that if they, some of them had said no. And I said, okay, I just value greatly from having weekly supervision meetings just to make sure that um, my work is being done correctly and just to make sure that I'm on the right track and progressing and everything. And if they said that they're unavailable to do that, then I like to say, is there any way that we can do every other week? If they say yes, then I say, okay, great. Then for that other week, is it okay that I will email you some questions or just like a little summary of how my week went and, you know, 
communication, then I also emphasize how communication is really important to me, especially for my growth and my mindset. So I kind of go in with the plan of knowing that for me, supervision weekly is helpful. And then also I ask is because I can be very picky with my email in the sense of like checking it all the time or not checking it very often. So one thing I ask, which I think a lot of us could be like uh, that, we pick yeah. times like, I'll check my email from this time and this time. And it's like your email's up the whole day. I am like, like so good at checking email once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> or you have like three emails and it's just like, which one did I check? Which one did I not check? And it's like, oh my gosh, so many. So then that's one thing I make note of is ask them, you know, how often basically do you want me to check my email or do you send okay. emails a lot throughout the day? What other questions do you ask when you're in an interview? So I asked them, obviously, what expectations do you have for me as an individual? Are there other, um, how's the like support network in the sense of asking questions? Does it come in like a timely manner? And when, if they ask for details, I say timely, not necessarily meaning the day of, because realistically, that could be very unrealistic. So say time and manner within the next, you know, two or three days. And then also one thing that I like to ask is um, also about team meetings. Because like I said, communication is a big thing, especially with word when working with like students and everything. And then also, I like to ask if there's any like breach of confidentiality. So since I work with students as an executive functioning coach and everything, um, I like to make sure that my boss knows about what I'm communicating with, with the parents. And so I'll check back in with her to make sure that there is no like breach of confidentiality for anything. If I need to speak with the like therapist and stuff. Um, and then also one thing like going back to email and communication is oftentimes, I don't know about you or if you've had to pass it where your bosses have given you their like, phone number and they'll say like, you know, call me if you need anything. I'll actually follow up with them and ask them like, is it okay if I text you or call you if I need something? They say, yes. I say, great. Like what are, what's the latest I can do that for you? Cause I don't want to do it. I don't say what are hours. I always ask what's the latest because then that's more specific for me. So I often like to ask questions that are more specific so that I can easily write them down and put them down. So I kind of have on, I also like to type and print out a list of everything that's of importance for that job. So like, don't text text, don't text or call past seven, check email at least three times a day, every other week supervision, feel free to email with any questions. So those are some of the things that I like to ask. My boss, and that's something that I learned myself is that how communication really helps me. Now, in a field like social work, um, where probably the the being of most of uh, our, our existence in this field is paperwork, um, how do you uh, sort of manage your your paperwork, but also in the realm of like to the lens of self advocacy for uh, getting paperwork completed, getting it done on time. If you need help with it, like how do you go about that? So what I like to do for paperwork is I like to kind of set myself up for a reward. So I like to get put, put out during my day times when I want to get the paperwork done. And then at the end of the night, kind of get myself a reward, even if I haven't completed all of it, or even if I have. So just the fact that I'm able to sit down for a chunk. And what do you reward yourself with? So I will reward myself with a episode of a show that I'm watching on Netflix, which currently... All right, what are you watching right now? Have you seen this show Away? No. With astronauts? So no. It's about, it's about these astronauts that go to Mars. So I tend... That's one of my faults is I like to binge watch on things. So I really would like to limit myself to, okay, if I get this done, I get to watch one episode even though it's like four or five minutes long and I could get like two episodes done. No, just watch one and then make dinner. And then like, that's it. And you're good at regulating that. 
it's taken a long, <laughs> long time, depending on how I'm feeling and depending on the week. Yes and no. But do you know if you log into uh, Netflix on uh, uh, the Internet in your settings, you can turn off the automatically play the next episode? I did not. That actually would be pretty beneficial. Yeah, it gives your brain a chance to like, you know, because it's it's easier to if you have to take an action to keep going versus like I can just do nothing. And then the next episode is just like fed to me. It's. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, I remember uh, when I uh, worked at uh, some thinking of a past, couple of uh, past jobs and, and paperwork was always I always struggled with it. Um and so I remember asking a lot, a lot of questions about the type of paperwork uh, that, that is involved um, and if there was any like support, if uh, I would ever get behind um, on paperwork. I remember when I used to work in uh, uh, one of the, the jobs I worked in residential uh, treatment and um, we would sometimes get these uh, new um, new kids who were uh, sometimes they were awards of the state. And we had to do this, like, we had 30 days to complete this, basically a 30 page, like, intake, social history, like, everything. And I remember sometimes having, like, literally sleeping in my office, like, like trying to get this thing done. I mean, it's, uh, so that was, I mean, and I talked before about bending the world to, to ourselves. When I got, went, got into private practice, that was like one of the things where I was like, you know what? Like, no one's making me write notes my notes are literally going to be just so i can jog my memory of our last like conversation um so i you know when we, we i meet with the, the client the next time i can pull that back up but like this whole notion of writing these long like progress notes i'm like i actually don't need to do that and which is a really just wonderful freedom to be able to have and then now that i don't even do clinical work i do all uh, coaching groups like there's very little paperwork at all it, it's so, which is wonderful Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing that I definitely do like to have. And that's also one thing that I do want to help educate other people is that, you know, there is no like perfect way to do notes, especially for like work and stuff. And you should be able to, you know, modify it for yourself. And people should be able to understand that. And if they can't, then that's something that is your time to kind of advocate for. That's something that to show that, hey, there's a lot of different ways to take notes. This is what works best for me. Is it okay that I try to do that for, you know, working with my other clients? So. Yeah, so let's talk about like share what the need is, check in with what the expectation is, and then just engage in the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's pretty much all. So let's let's take another quick break. Um, when we come back, I want to talk about your work as a uh, you know, co-leader of an adult group uh, at ADA. Um, and also, I know that you spoke at the uh, the LDA National Conference in February of 2020, which seems like there were there were people going to conferences in 2020. It's like the, the yeah, the very beginning of a year, things were of course sort of normal, and then um, so yeah, let's take a quick break, and we will be right back. If you are new to ADHD Rewired, welcome. I want to let you know about our other podcasts we have here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. If you're looking for a 15-minute podcast full of tips, dry humor, and a few dad jokes, check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb. This week, he drops a podcast about sequencing to help manage your ADHD. And if you would like to ask Will a question, go to hackingyouradhd.com and scroll down to the start recording button. Record a question and submit it and he might answer your question on his podcast. That's hackingyouradhd.com. And for conversations like these here on ADHD Rewired with a focus on kids, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. And coming in 2021, be on the lookout for two new podcasts. We're going to be launching ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens and the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with Moira Mabin. Come join me in our growing podcast family for the first live Q&A of 2021. The next one is going to be on Tuesday, January 12th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And if you're listening to this after that, we do this every second Tuesday of the month at the same time. To register... Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. And to everyone who has applied to join our Facebook community in the last two or three months, 
We still have not forgotten about you. We are working through processing your applications. We are just behind, but we are digging ourselves out of that hole. We have a goal to uh, process all of those and get you all in before the new year. Can we do it? We'll find out and we'll let you know on the podcast. If you want to join our secret Facebook community, it'll be worth the wait. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash community. That's ADHDrewired.com slash community. And for those of you who listen to audiobooks on Audible, you can now listen to ADHD Rewired on there too. You can also leave us a rating and review on there too, which would be super helpful. And if you're not on Audible, but you want to check it out, you can get a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. And in 2021, we're going to be launching a bunch of new initiatives that we are really excited about, including a telesummit that Jessica McCabe and I are going to be putting on called the ADHD Friendly World Summit. That's going to be happening probably in the third quarter of 2021. We are also going to be launching an adult study hall membership. More information on that to come. And so many of you have requested merch. We are right now in development plans for creating merch. So this and more are all coming. So stay tuned. It's going to be an exciting year in 2021. To make sure that you get informed, come to our website and join our mailing list. And be sure to hit subscribe on whatever podcast player you are listening to this on right now. All right, we are back with Jessica McLaren. So you are a co-leader of a young adult group at ADA, which is the adult uh, ADHD organization. Um, how long have you been doing that for? I've been doing that for about, I want to say three years. And is it, are you doing it all, all online? Yes, it's been all online. And, yeah. And yeah, ADA has been online for a number of years now. Mm-hmm. Um, and you spoke at the LDA National Conference. How, what was that like for you? That mind blowing. So yeah. I kind of got peer pressured. I like to say peer pressured by someone who is a worldwide known executive coach. who's like published a book and she was like, why don't you go share your story at LDA, the conference and put in a proposal. And I said, I've never written one. Oh, I'll help you. So you can't really say no to someone that's like published a book is worldwide known. So and they happened to say, yes, I was the youngest speaker there. I, I, was, I have spoken at like schools before, but never at a national conference. So I was super excited, a bit nervous, but I was just super excited just to network and also just to have other people hear my side. Can you share who that, who that person was? That So um, it was Jody. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I'm not going to lie to you at all. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so related. So related. I, yeah. I don't. I don't know how to. She's she's published a book. She's the founder of JST Coaching. Oh, Jody Sleeper Triplet. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say I'm not trying to pronounce her last yeah, name. It's okay. No, we're pretty and, well. And I'm sure but, she'll fully understand that too. And I think that person. Yeah. Will. Yeah, but she was the one that actually was the one that pushed me to write a proposal. So I'm very thankful for that for her, but. Talk about pushing yourself outside your. What was your topic? Um, what did you What did you talk so about? So my topic was about how um, parents and educators can impact on the successful transition for individuals with LGA and ADHD. So the biggest thing that I wanted to focus on was the lack of education parents, also educators, have on the transitioning aspect. Because that's a huge, huge time in someone's life. And you're talking about like the the, the life transition, like between uh, um, like leaving school, not not like transitioning between second and third period. Transition in general. Okay. So for educators, for educators, it could be transition from first second period. For parents and educators, it's transition from like high school to college, high school to career, college to a career. You know, whatever. Pretty you know, shared my story and how the impact that, you know, parents can make by being understanding, but also asking questions, you know, being able to be open-minded and ask questions, what works best for you? 
and having the student kind of answer those questions and kind of come up with that plan. So being able to constant communication. So let me ask you this. We, we've talked a little bit about or a lot about like some of the, the scenarios in which you uh, advocated for yourself. Um, what would you say self-advocacy isn't? Oh, what a question. So self-advocacy isn't something that is, I want to say it's not really noticed in the sense of what it actually is. So oftentimes people misunderstand advocacy and everyone can have their own definition of anything, which I totally believe is capable, especially because everyone's different. Everyone's different learners. Everyone's a different person. We're not all the same. So our definition of something will vary. But I definitely do believe that advocacy often is misunderstood in the sense of under the very like general term of everything. So that's what I think that advocacy is. Okay. So now if I were to say, uh, I'm in a work scenario and I said, um, I have ADHD. I can't be here on time. Am I, am I self advocating for myself? I would say that you are in the no, but you are in the process and working towards it. Mm, so I like, I like to say, because I like to take a twist on anything negative and make it positive. So probably reaction you might that you're probably going to get is, well, make sure on time and figure it out or take your meds. <laughs> and then you can kind of go home and, you know, if your friends talk to you or not, or just figure it, figure it out. But then that's that time to see, okay, maybe that's not the right environment. So instead of saying, I have ADHD, I can't be here on time, what would be a more um, self advocacious is that a word? I think it might be. I'm not sure. Um, uh, let's, yeah, let's play, let's play along. Um, what would be uh, a more effective approach to self-advocacy if you have ADHD in the workplace and you are having a hard time being on time? So what you can go up to your boss or supervisor and say that I work best when I come in at 8 a.m. instead of at 6.30. Is it okay that I come in at eight and stay a little like an hour or two later rather than coming at six thirty and leaving at four. Can I come in at eight and leave at six? So you're saying as the person who is self advocating to not only identify the problem, but also offer a solution. Mm -hmm. Because if by offering a solution, you're more likely to get what you asked for because that's takes less off of what your boss or your supervisor has to do. So you're basically letting them say yes and no. What are some things that you think people in the workplace need to keep in mind when they are self-advocating for accommodations? They need to keep in mind that things may not always go the way that they expected. And that in that meaning that if they go in asking for a set, you know, time to come to work and to leave, if the bosses know they need to understand that they can still make some wiggle room, but also to, even though you advocate doesn't necessarily mean you get what you want, but you could get something out of it. So just understanding that you might not get what you want, but you may be able to come to compromise. And if you can't get what you want, then it's okay. Now then it's time to figure out how to problem solve and figure out how to make whatever issue you have doable. And if not, then it's time to reach out for help. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, and I'm working with, with clients around this issue is, you know, and it's, I think this is true in all work environments is you have to think about what is the mission and goal of the organization you are working for and how it would um, getting these accommodations help uh, fulfill your role in helping the organization achieve its mission and goal, whether it's, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of human centered work, whether it's in education or in, uh, in social services or in, in business. Like, how would these accommodations help, like, improve the bottom line for the business? Um, cause it's, you know, they, it's unlike schools, right? Like, they don't have, like, you still need to do the job that's required. Right. Like they don't care that you have ADHD and I, and people mm -hmm. often think that sounds harsh when I say that, but it's the reality of the matter. Like 
having ADHD does not mean that, that you're excused from not being on time or from being late with your paperwork or from, you know, speaking out impulsively, like all of these things, like you are still, we are all still responsible for our own behavior, right? Which includes how to negotiate, um, like what, uh, what you might need. So, you know, whether that's, let's, let's say, um, even finding out things like, is there a quiet office space? Let's say you work in an op- open office plan, which, um, I mean, I know this is a kind of a blanket statement and it doesn't apply to everyone, but if you're going to an interview for a job and you see that they have an open office plan, you might as well just like turn around and, and walk away because that's, um, that has to be one of the worst, like, I once worked at a call center, which I look, and this is right before I was diagnosed with ADHD. And I think back to that now, and I was just like, oh my, I cannot believe it even lasted a minute in that environment. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Boiler Room? Mm Mm-hmm. It was literally, I felt like I was a character in that movie. Like it was, oh my it, was gosh. it was so spot on to that movie. It was insane. Um, but yeah, like, so knowing what, just because people, you know, other people can do something, don't shit on yourself. Don't be like, oh, I should be able to do this because other people are doing this, right? Like I, for me, like I have auditory processing issues. Like I hear everything. So if working in an open office plan would be disastrous for me, mm-hmm. right? Like unless like I'm not doing intellectual work, if I'm doing more physical work, then it's not a big deal, right? But if I'm having to think or if I'm having to write, if I'm having to listen, like, nope, like can't do it. So part of self-advocacy really begins with self-awareness. Right. You have to know yourself so you can know what, where you're going to be successful. Um, cause it's, you know, it's what you don't want to do is, or is set up this life where like your, your plan is just try as hard as you possibly can. Right. Like, yeah, we do have to try Mm -hmm. often a lot harder than most people, but don't let that be your only strategy. Yeah. Right. That's, I mean, that's soul crushing. Like it, it won't last. Like it's, it, well, it leads to a lot of, of additional mental health related issues. Um, and I think that when we know that we are supported in a space that works for our brain, that's when we can really thrive. And I think when we are spending a lot of energy, um, trying to kind of masquerade as normal, it stresses our brain even more, which then exacerbates our ADHD symptoms even more. So finding that right fit of a job is so critically important when you have ADHD. And I think that people with ADHD, we don't have the luxury of working a job that we don't love. Yeah, no, exactly. And oftentimes what I like to tell my clients is also the hardest word to hear is practice. And over time, you'll develop those skills. And it sucks to hear that, but it's like, take out that piece of paper right now, that pencil and think about kind of what triggers you think about what helps helps you in a work environment or just what helps you understand in general and what would be ideal for someone to understand and have the piece of paper. And when you're looking for jobs, applying for jobs in a workspace, see if any of those can be a check mark crossed off and you can kind of have your little cheat sheet there for you. But the word that everyone hates, but it's true is it comes over time with practice. Jessica, what are you practicing right now for yourself? Um, I'm definitely practicing with for myself is working on some self care and not getting so stuck up in work that I love and enjoy doing, recognizing that I can't read every executive functioning coaching book. I can't read every ADHD book out there. I can't watch every video on YouTube. I can't listen to every webinar. So definitely taking myself into self care. And that aspect and not overworking my brain because as we all know, it's very difficult, especially when very passionate about something. With having that ADHD brain, you're in like the mode of you love it. It's interesting, but you know, your brain's fried. There's no way it's actually remember you're actually gonna remember it the next day. So you, you also said that your your disability is um just a difference to be proud of. Let me ask you, what's something that you're really proud of that you've uh that you've done lately? I'm really proud of, actually, I did this last night. I'm really proud of sharing how to make, how you can make a negative scenario or a negative statement into something positive. I shared it with some um my friends yesterday who are having, they also have um, disabilities as well. And 
one example was having a teacher not understand that some of the difficulties she was having was because of her disability and they were just looking at it as, as an excuse. So I'm really proud of is that I was able to help her see how you can make that negative thought and for yourself, how to make it into something positive. Because I believe that and just kind of putting that different spin of that mindset. Jessica McLaren, thank you so much for the work that you are doing and for sharing your your story here on the podcast. Um, do, you have a, do you have a website or anything? Is there a way people can reach you? I do not have a website, but I do have my um, email that people can reach me at um, jtm2011 at yahoo.com. JTM2011 at yahoo.com. We will put that in the show notes. So if you're driving and you're like, wait, I want to contact Jessica, but I don't know how to write that down at the moment. Um, just go to ADHDrewire.com slash whatever episode number this is. Just put that in the slash um, and you'll have her contact information there. Jessica, thank you so much. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, 
magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability, And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.